Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome back to this week's Weekly D, where I have the lovely Angela on with me. Angela and I get to talk about everything social media, and I really like to hear Angela's perspective of this. She works in marketing, and she's got a lot of knowledge about social media. So there are a load of really, really good tips in this episode. I really hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, this is the Weekly D, because, honey, if you aren't getting your D on the daily, you better at least be getting it once on the weekly. If you're not getting any and you want some tea, then come and join Dan up on the Weekly D. It's the Weekly D. Hey, Angela. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. I'm super excited to have you and I've got so many questions for you. But before I get started on the social media talk with you, and I've got so many questions for you. I wanted to kind of just go over with you a little bit about you, just for anyone who's listening to this that maybe is crazy and not following you yet. Um, tell them a little bit about you, who you are, what you do. So yeah, here's your here's your moment. Tell <laughs> them a little bit about you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, so a bit about me, I am a marketing manager. So I've been working in marketing for about nine years now, and I've done everything you can think of in marketing. Um, I worked with small mom and pop businesses, nationally owned brands. I've done e-commerce. I've done events. Um, but over the last couple of years, my focus has been primarily with uh, digital marketing and social media. Um, I'm also a pole instructor, so I teach at Raven Studios. Over here in Seattle, Washington, Dan, I don't know if you've ever had the chance to travel in the West Coast in the United States, but if you ever so make I'm it to Seattle. So I'm one of these like basic bitches who's been to like, <laughs> you know, it's just like I've been to New York, I've been to, I've actually been to LA and then I've been to Miami because that's where the cruises go from, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I really, really want, I do want to come and visit. I feel like there's so many cool places that I've a hundred percent missed out on. So yeah, a hundred percent would love to, but yeah, is it cool there? Yes. You'll have to come check out Seattle and Raven Studios. It's a beautiful studio. And I saw that you're doing a studio contest on well, yeah, it's, it's well, it's like I'm trying to avoid the word. Like it is yeah. like the world's prettiest pole <laughs> studio competition, yeah. but like, I didn't want it to be like, oh, if you're not on the list, your studios are going to eat kind of thing. <laughs> I kind of wanted it to be like, I just feel like studios are going through a real hard time at the moment. I just feel like studios are really suffering. They are in the UK anyway. Like, and I just thought it'd be really cool to use the platform to kind of promote a load of studios um, and also use it to, to get our engagement up. Um, and I don't like to lie about stuff like that as well, by the way. Anyone listening to this who's like, oh, he's only doing it for engagement. I absolutely am, by the way, and I have no shame in saying that. But, you know, I also think it's going to be a really nice way to, you know, raise awareness to some really cool studios around the world because oh, yeah. I keep seeing at the moment some crazy studios and I'm like, Whoa. I know it's, I, I think about like when I started, which was about five or six years ago and the level and like how studios have changed into like these world-class facilities. Um, it's insane. Right. So. And literally, literally I look at, it's so funny. One of my students, one of my instructors, she, she like messaged me and was like, Oh, I hope we're going to see our studio on there. And it's a hilarious joke because our studio is this tiny pokey little thing. Like in the UK, I, I don't even know if there's any UK studios on there because our studios, we just don't get studios. Like I feel like in the U S there's more of them. I mean, you right. should see some of the Korean ones we have on this oh, list. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. They are like, they're like fucking palaces. I'm like, I'd yeah. live in that studio. <laughs> and I've seen some in like Dubai, right? And it's just like, right. so you're in the skies. It's incredible. But Raven is very beautiful and should be somewhere on the list. I don't know where, but it's, it's a great studio. And I've, you know, if you Do you know what, actually, the one thing we've, we have actually noticed is it's really hard um, with this prettiest pole studio thing, just while we're talking about it, because mm -hmm. like, um, I was chatting to one of my friends, Laura Lou, she's got a really pretty mm -hmm. studio. The difficulty is, is that the photo that we need for the competition needs mm -hmm. to be a picture of the studio, the actual pole right. space. But a lot of them have really pretty like receptions or whatever, and then it goes into a very normal looking pole studio. Yeah. But the difficulty is, is if I if I take a photo of the pole studio, it's just poles in a room. <laughs> and then obviously if I take a photo of the reception, it's there's no poles, so it's not a pole right. studio. <laughs> so there's actually a few studios that we really love the look of, but we haven't been able to use because we don't have 
polls in the photo, which is, yeah. But there are, I'll tell you what, there are, so I always remember actually once when I went to um, Polar, Cyprus was it? Cyprus, something like that. And I remember mm -hmm. there being a studio there that was owned by a Russian woman and her husband bought her the studio. And, oh my God, when I tell you, this woman must have had so much money. It yeah, was huge. It was just insane. I remember just thinking like, I've never seen something like this in my life. It was crazy, but um, sorry, totally, we totally got off subject <laughs> there. No, I love it. But, um, I want to ask you, so are you still doing the marketing thing as yeah. your job? Oh, so this, so poll is a side hustle for you. Yeah, so Pole is my um, my side hustle. I work full time. I actually work for a nonprofit right now, which I absolutely love. Um, and I, where people, if they do know me, likely will know me from social media on um, like TikTok or Instagram. So I started posting content right at the beginning of the pandemic, actually, which I think a lot of people did too. Or it really it it was um. It was a catalyst for a lot of us to get online more because right. we had nothing to do. We were just inside. So at the time, TikTok, um, it was really, it was, it was starting to, to pick up. Um, and the poll community on there, the poll community on there, um, it, there wasn't a ton of people. There were definitely pollers posting their content. Um, but I think it was still, and I think it is still very light on that. Um, for a number of reasons. Why do you, um, I was going to say, what, why do you think that is? Because I, I have this theory around the fact that so many people just get their stuff blocked on there and it's it's yeah. a lot less likely to be blocked on Insta. So I think people kind of only do that because Insta seems to be a little bit easier to get your stuff by on there. Whereas on yeah. TikTok, it just seems to always get blocked. And I find the struggle for me isn't even the blocking of my stuff because I do a lot of my stuff, especially if it's heel stuff, it's mainly fully really mm -hmm. clothed. But I find the issue that I have is the music it's mm -hmm. like if you've done a choreo to this song and then you type that song into TikTok, they'll give you a mm -hmm. clip of it, but it'll be this yeah. random patch. It may not of the be song. the right clip you need. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? So yeah. What, what are your theories behind the TikTok issue? I, so TikTok is interesting where I feel like a lot of folks in the poll community may have tried or dabbled in, but um, it's kind of, I can see, I've actually seen a lot of folks like stop posting and I'm kind of on that train as well. But I think it's, yeah, the apps doesn't necessarily support poll content. They have a very strict community guidelines. And I think um, content suppression is a big thing on that app. Um, and I also think just the nature of poll content does not do well on TikTok. I think if you are scrolling on TikTok, the, what I find um, that to, tends to have more engagement is like the talking head content. So you'll see Absolutely. a lot of people talking. And um, I think also mm -hmm. something you'll see on TikTok is like a more natural kind of cadence of talking. Like you'll see people setting up their like, or people in the car or like people, it's like they're in bed talking and like tons of engagement there. So I think that people tend to like this more natural style of like an authentic type of content where in poll, we often do very like posed or, you know, we have our camera set up, we have a beautiful lighting um, that... I, that's kind of, that's a part of my theory. I don't quite have all the answers for that, but I, I do know there yeah. are some pollers that have found success on it and um, I found mm. varying success on it, but yeah, it's just, it's a big part of it. It's a content suppression. Yeah, I find as well, like, the, what people want from social media is so different now. I mm -hmm. I noticed because I had a change of style in my own socials and I, I was mm -hmm. really just kind of doing it as a, an experiment really. I was again doing a lot more talking head videos, doing a lot right. more like maybe funny posts that people could actually engage with and my engagement mm -hmm. just shot up. Um, mm -hmm. The following it is creeping up. It goes up, it kind of goes like some days it'll be like 50 day, 50 day, 50 day and then some days it'll be like five people a day or whatever. I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> but the engagement is good and that, that's really good for me. And I, I was really working on more the engagement. I feel like, I feel like what I do is so niche anyway. It, it's like mm -hmm. straight girls don't really follow a gay pole dancer if they're not a pole dancer, you know? It's like <laughs> females who do pole follow me, you know? Mm -hmm. Again, um, men who pole might follow me, but gay men don't follow me because it's just mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I know it sounds weird, but gay men, aren't majorly interested in what I do. And then it's like mm. straight men, absolutely, of course, do not follow me. Um, mm. So it's that whole thing of like, yeah, I, I'm gobsmacked to be honest, I've even built up to what I have. I'm just like, wow, it's actually quite nice to even get to that. So I'm never too bothered about the following. I'm more bothered about yeah. the engagement, but I think, oh yeah, I think people 
want this connection with someone, this be able to, or to almost be able to talk to them. And I think it's because we've gone from having conversations with people to spending loads of time on our phones. And it's yeah. that whole thing of, like, I think people are trying now to get that from their content. It's like a bit weird, really. But yeah, I don't know. I, I just find it a bit of an odd situation that we have got ourselves into with content creation. What's I your most it, popular yeah. content that you post? Um, I would say that that has changed over it, it, it. Like you mentioned, these things change and they like the algorithms change. They like different things one day and then it's like, nope, it's not going to work this day. Um, yeah. so I've, um, my content has always been around. So I'm, I'm, I teach heels and, um, more of like the pole choreo aspect of pole. So, um, my content has always been focused around like beginner focused tutorials. And I think that that's where I found a lot of success is like, I think a lot of my content is, I want to say like achievable in a way, um, or it, the, the, my movement style is like, can be identifiable to folks, at least those who are starting out. So, um, you won't see me necessarily doing crazy tricks up the pole, which, um, I absolutely love, but, um, not my personal thing. Um, so I think that's where, um, I found success. So just kind of focusing more on the beginner to intermediate content. And do you find it hard managing having a marketing job and doing the social media? Because obviously it's a lot of time taken to create this yeah. content and stuff. Like how do you manage the the time of doing both? I should, you're, I should yeah. you're doing this marketing job full time, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I have actually been talking about this recently of feeling like this creative rut almost because content creation is like, it's like this constant thing as creators, as pole creators, like we're all, we're constantly thinking about like what we're doing next. And, um, it's, it is hard with the full-time job of not feeling like I don't have the mental space to do that while taking care of things in my personal life, like keeping my house clean, going on walks, like, you know, working out. Um, so it, it, it is pretty challenging, but I think I've kind of, um, I think being able to just separate as much as I can of like dedicating certain days that I know like, oh, I'm going to have a free day today. Like, let's go to the studio and play um, and kind of like freeing myself from forcing myself to post, which I was doing for a moment. And I will say, Dan, I've actually there was a period of time when I did do social media and um, pole instructing full time. It was about like a four or five month stint. Um, it was something that I, I've been thinking about for a long time. And I finally, I quit my job and I was like, I'm going to go full into it. And I realized that I fucking hated it. Sorry for guessing, but Why? I yeah, absolutely Why hated hate it? it. Um, I admire people like you and like folks that do this full time and entrepreneurs because it is so hard and it's not for everybody. And I think that that was something I had to realize after trying was like the hustle is it's, it's constant. It's all day. It's, and it's constant. Like you, you don't really have like a break necessarily, which I think that's the fortunate part of like sometimes having like a nine to five is like you do have your, the rest of your day. Um, but yeah, being a full-time entrepreneur is really difficult. I told myself that. Oh, uh, so what was funny was, um, I wanted to make sure I had a number in mind each month. I wanted to make sure that I could sustain this. And if it's like, um, I had a certain number in mind and I wanted to be able to hit the number, like my typical monthly salary. And then I know that I'm on the right path. Um, right. after the five months, it's funny because I did hit those numbers and I did do better than I thought. And, um, y you know, I was doing, um, private lessons. I was doing workshops. I was also doing a lot of brand collabs at that moment, but the constant like stress over that was, it was a lot. So it's, I admire it, folks. People, yeah. But the thing is people, people see that. So a lot of people say to me like, how do you do the, all these workshops on the weekend, all these online classes? I'm like, Oh sweetie, what you're seeing is only the half of what I do. Yeah. How do you think these things are organized? I have to organize all of it as well. Like it's freaking nightmare it's so much fun mm. and the, do you know what the thing that this is why i admire people who as well have that sort of like you know they they acknowledge they have a skill like you have in marketing mm. and you've kept your marketing job and stuff mm. i always say to people and i actually have talked about this many times on the podcast about how like if i could go back and go to university to be qualified in 
computer science, coding, something like that, something that's like a really cool job, like very well paid. Um, I would, I actually would. And people are always shocked by that. And it's because I hate this pressure that I have of constantly needing to try harder, harder, harder to work, work, yeah. work. And that's because we have such a pressure as poll teachers because we only have a set amount of time that we're going to be able to do this. And yeah, sure, we might be able to teach beginners up until, mm. I don't know, 60s maybe. <laughs> am I going to want to, am I going to want to yeah. be teaching fucking beginners <laughs> in my 60s? Let me tell you, my body, my body feels like it's giving up yeah. on me now, let alone when I'm in my 60s, another 30 years. Oh my God, you got to be kidding me. I'm just like, I, I work so hard now and I earn mm. well because I want to, I want to invest that money into my future. Right. <laughs> I, I don't want to have to work when I'm 60. I'd love that to be an option. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's that whole thing of like, I don't know how easy that's going to be. But I'm relying on my husband making lots of money and living off of him instead. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> that's I think that's something I've talked about before is like, it's okay to have your hobby just be your hobby. And I think that this is like a, um, this is like a, a thing that's happening a lot with like social media and hustle culture too. I hate, I, I hate that word, but, um, it's Absolutely. like, it's like, whether it's like crocheting or uh, making art or something, it's like always, uh, I think we kind of have been trained to think like, how am I going to monetize this? But right. ultimately I think, and it works for some people, but I also want to remind folks that's like, it can just be that for you. It, a hobby can just be a hobby. You can just enjoy it or your passion. You don't have to try to find ways to make money off it. Or if sometimes you do make money, that's great, but you don't, you know, it, it can be whatever you'd like it to be. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be lovely to like, it, it, you know, if you did want to make a little bit of money from it, just have it as your mm -hmm. side hustle. Like, oh, yeah. wouldn't that be amazing? Like, yes. you know, to have this, like teaching some podcasts or, or like you said, oh, yeah. I assume you still take, like if someone books you for workshops now, you mm -hmm. might not have the time for as many, but you know, mm -hmm. maybe you'd still do if a really good opportunity came up right. and someone said, Hey, we want you to come to, Barbados yeah. you'd be like fuck yeah and it's that whole thing like but you've got this full-time job you've got your regular income I kind of like that and I think social media has created this beast within the industry that people are desperate to be poll celebrities and I find that really I, I find it odd in a weird way I understand it yeah. because obviously like it must have happened to me at some point because that's why I worked so hard to get what I, I did um but yeah it's it's always become like an obsession for some people. And um, and I think that then leads into really almost why I'm doing this podcast is because so many people then ask me like, how do I build my socials? How do I then, mm -hmm. you know, start teaching workshops? How do I start competing? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I really noticed that's become a thing. And uh, like, why do you think that is? Like, how, why do you th how do you think we've got to that? I don't know. I really don't, Dan. That's a great question. I feel like it's changed. I, I, like I mentioned, I've been... Um, pole dancing for about five or six years now. And I, and when I started, like there were definitely pullers I looked up to on the internet, but I feel like over the last few years, really kicking off with the pandemic, it's been like this, this, I don't know, like this, uh, like rush to try to build this. And I, I think that that's, um, I think that that's really lovely for a lot of folks, but I think like for me, I, that happened to me and it was that awakening of realizing like it wasn't meant for me. Um, so yeah, it's, that, I, I would love so to be able to, to dabble. Someone, yeah. It's great to have someone say that on this podcast as well, because actually you're the first person to even talk about stuff like that, because so many people probably do feel this pressure to feel mm -hmm. like they need to be a teacher now. Like, yeah. do, do you know how many people are just like, Oh, you know, I've gone, I've gotten really advanced my shoe. I feel like I need to become a teacher now. I'm like, why? Why does that mean a natural progress to, yeah. why don't you just find another teacher that's going to be able to push you more? Like, why can't you just enjoy it? Because that's the whole thing of like, you know, once you, once you stop being a student, you're no longer mm -hmm. the student now, you're the teacher. And it's oh, like, yeah. you're going to have such a completely different relationship with it. I mean, so yeah. you're not teaching at all anymore. Oh, no. So I am teaching. I teach weekly classes still. So but like you're you doing it as a side thing. Yeah, it is. And it's I, I love being a part of the Raven community and getting to do that and still um, having the opportunity to kind of flex that muscle of like creating weekly choreos and um, and also getting the chance to be a student as well. But you, yeah, it's it's definitely a change. I think about this a lot with like the idea of performing. Um, 
I, I tell folks a lot of, in my audience, like, you don't have to perform if you don't want to. I, I, again, I like absolutely hate performing. I come to realize like, it's not for me, but I feel like sometimes there is a pressure to be like, after a certain amount of time doing pole, like, yeah, you got to perform now, like get on stage, but that's not necessarily true. Um, mm -hmm. You can do really whatever you want with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so funny that you should say that because I feel like, again, that was something that I used to do to my instructors, actually. There was a period mm -hmm. where I would say to all my instructors, like, I, I want you to compete at some point. I want you to represent mm -hmm. the studio. Fucking, I look back at that and I think, that is cringe. Like, I can't believe I did that. Like, And now I'm like, God, guys, if you don't want to perform, don't. Yeah. Like, it takes a certain type of person to really be able to as well, because it is oh, going to yeah. suck the life out of you. Let me tell you that. Like, yes. it, you're going to love the moment on stage. That three minutes mm -hmm. you're going to love, but let me tell you, the 300 hours <laughs> you're going to do before it are going to suck the life out of you. <laughs> it's true. You know, yeah. and some people do enjoy the process. And those people, mm -hmm. I take my hat off to you because I think it's so hard. I, um, I, I admire and I do enjoy yeah. it. I do enjoy it, but it's just that whole thing of like, I don't like doing it too often, you know? And it's like, I prefer obviously just put, I mean, competing, whole different ball game, e even worse than performing. Because at least with performing, you can just freestyle if you want to. But right. like, when you then got to compete, oh, you've got to go and put your best foot forward. And it's so intense. But yeah, I am, um, yeah. sorry, I've, I've totally gone off track. But it's, <laughs> no, it's an interesting subject because I find it really important. I'm really glad that you mentioned the whole thing of like, you didn't want to do that. Because I feel like so many people who will be listening to this, Mm -hmm. are probably were listening to this because they want to build up their socials to be able to do that but actually it's nice for someone to hear that someone did do that they did build up their socials they did go and do it full time and actually it wasn't for them <laughs> so i kind of love that and it hopefully will open people's eyes to being like you know this is another option you have <laughs> so we were talking earlier on and i said to you that i really wanted to talk to you about the subject so it was something that i found really really interesting we have obviously you were talking about it with tiktok i've just uh i want to talk to you now about instagram with this mm -hmm. shadow banning content content not being able to be seen we're getting these little notifications coming up that you know our stuff can't be shown to people because right. we've got a little orange flag on our account now mm -hmm. um and people are having to delete content now I was chatting to someone today. I've got this theory and I want to know what you think of it because I see sometimes people's profiles and they don't have very many videos on their profiles and they've got all these followers. And I and I remember thinking, I'm sure I've seen this person post more than this. And then I realized they're deleting their stuff. And I was like, why are they deleting their stuff? And I've never really understood why. I thought maybe it was just they were super critical mm -hmm. and they didn't like it, so they deleted it. But actually, here's my theory. And I don't know what your thoughts are on this. People are saving content now and not engaging with it anymore. And I think that pisses a lot of people off because I see posts about it all the time. A lot of people are, um, you know, posting and getting their content banned. Um, and a lot of the stuff that is getting banned tends to be content that was posted a long time ago. So my theory is, I wonder if people are posting and then deleting it so that A, their account doesn't get flagged. And so B, people can't steal shit off of them. What's your theory behind that? That's really interesting. I haven't noticed mm. that. That's, um, I'm curious if they're like, yeah, that's, the, I've never noticed that being an issue. But what you did mention of people saving content and not interacting, but just saving the post, I definitely know that that's a big thing. I think just, um, if you have a business or a creator account, you're able to see analytics. Um, yeah. so you can see the saves, the shares, likes, obviously. Um, and it is always funny when the saves are always kind of like, you know, they're, they're, cre they're either more or right. not, they're not in ratio, but, um, it is a very interesting experience. Um, no, I don't, I haven't noticed about folks archiving and I'm wondering if, um, I'm kind of leaning towards people, uh, their content getting removed or they, they are forced to archive it. That's definitely Maybe. happened to me. That's definitely happened to me um, recently, especially. Um, I think the algorithm has gotten more critical of poll related content. And yeah. once you get on their bad side, it's really hard to get off. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a challenge that a lot of us face. I am, um, when you mentioned that, I just remember I screenshot something just um, earlier on today. Um, a girl that I know called, Han I don't know if you follow her, maybe she's a UK girl, Hannah Keynes. 
And she posted mm-hmm. saying, um, she was like, never mind the comments. I've, I've had more saves than actual likes on some of my posts. One of her posts had 1,151 likes, mm-hmm. 1,613 saves. Yeah. That's just crazy. But why do you think people are doing that? Why aren't they engaging? I don't know. And it's, it's interesting because, um, um, I've kind of, we briefly mentioned it, but, um, the idea of engagement baiting is super interesting to me, um, from Meta's perspective. Um, so as a, like a little summary, engagement baiting, um, Meta has changed their tune a bit on how they define it, but, um, years ago, and I think it's happening now, like they really policed engagement baiting on Facebook. I think a lot of people were doing like, you know, one like equals one prayer, that kind of like content, <laughs> like just spammy stuff. So, um, so they were really like not a fan of engagement baiting, which is like content that is asking people to share, like interact some way. Um, but Engagement baiting now is, um, you will often see it like in, in captions or people are like, let me know what your, et cetera, or comment this or things like that. Um, that can be considered engagement baiting. Meta doesn't necessarily, um, it's not like it's a banned thing or anything. You won't get in trouble for doing it, but just being mindful how you do it. Um, it can be used to, um, like if you're encouraging meaningful interactions, like, tell me a story about this, like things like that, I think, um, are fine. Um, but I think, yeah, um, just knowing how to do that, I think could be really helpful of like how to use these type of things to get folks to interact. Um, what techniques meta, do you use? Do you have some that you use? Um, I've used, so it's funny because I think I was using not the great, so I'll, I will say like save, share, things like that. So those are things I've used before until I've learned that it's not a a necessarily favorable thing. I think I'll still probably end up using that because I'm like, whatever, I can't always please like this algorithm. Um, (laughs) But I think just knowing that could help people a lot of like how they're using call to actions. Um, Mm. Why people aren't interacting, I have no idea. I would love to know if someone can (laughs) tell me. Um, I think it's also just how much content there is nowadays. And right. how I think that's the issue. I, I think people are just seeing too much. It's like yeah. they're going through and they're saving, but they're just forgetting that actually you can interact with that person as well because yeah. they're just scrolling, scrolling. You know, people, yeah. and I know, and I, I, I don't, I'm not saying this about other people. I'm, I know because I do it too. Like, where I'm just scrolling, but doing it wrong. I, mm-hmm. because I'm a content creator, I always comment if I've saved something. Always. Mm-hmm. Minimum of an emoji. Minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, because I feel it's just etiquette at this point. Yeah. Um, I feel like if you're going to take something from someone, something that you're going to use, that's going to benefit you in the long run. The least you could do mm. is drop a little cute emoji, right? Yeah. God. Yeah. But, and, and again, I've, I've said this on other podcasts. I'm going to say this again, if you're listening to this and you are one of these people that saves, like just be conscious of it because it's these content creators. We, we take so much of our time that there's nothing more like, sad for us than people that are are obviously enjoying our content but not enough to actually engage with it properly mm-hmm. and uh it's it's just really sad as a content creator when you realize that actually so much of your work is just being thrown right. away and it's like you know we work so hard for it so please and do especially if we you know uh, i think a lot of creators in and out of the poll space too we give so much free content and free resources yes. and education. So I think like, yes, at a minimum, um, saving does help the post in general, just kind of the overall metrics of the post, but it's always nice to see that engagement and the visibility to push it further. Um, things like, um, things like completing the video watch time is also a big one. And like, I think the biggest one is just sharing to your story or, um, even sharing to a friend, I think really helps as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, that's actually a lot of the reason why I started doing the short, funny videos, because mm-hmm. I noticed that people were sharing it. Hey, what's up, everyone? I just wanted to interrupt this episode with a quick little bit of information on my online business, The Poll Destroyers. 
If you haven't found out about it already, the Pole Destroyers is an online platform which provides strength and conditioning coaching for pole online from the comfort of your own home. And I can't tell you how many pole dancers I meet on a daily basis who aren't able to achieve some of their dream moves because they aren't strong enough. And now you can be by training from the comfort of your own home with this strength and conditioning program. Many people got a lot of success from my 31 day program, which you are able to access on demand. And you can also do live classes with me. But the thing I love about this program is that each class has an individual theme. So we do all sorts of different theme classes. We have the Pole Destroyers Quiz. We have Choreo Cardio. We have Flip the Coin, Dice of Doom. My cat Roxy teaches a class. Yes, cats can teach conditioning. You will be gobsmacked. It's just a really good, fun way to do conditioning at a really cost-effective price. So if that's something that you're interested in, please do go and check out thepoledestroyers.com or head to my Instagram at Dan Rosenpole and feel free to DM me with any questions you have. Anyway, let's get back to the podcast. But the problem is that with pole dancers, and I'd love your advice on this, what would your advice, so say for example someone came to you and was like, you know, give me some tips on how you sort of like grew your socials mm-hmm. and stuff. And they said like, no one shares my posts. What would you, what would you look at first? And then what would you tell them to change? Because the problem that I have is that so many pole dancers are just sharing pole combos. And the problem is that everyone mm-hmm. shares pole combos. Now, what would you tell mm-hmm. them to do that's going to make their content shareable? Yeah, that's a great question. You mentioned like having those relatable posts, I think are really great. Um, sprinkled into your content and, you know, a, a a tip I, I might share with that person is like looking outside of pole and looking for inspiration in like the greater landscape of content. So I think the makeup folks do it really well. The fashion people do it really well, um, but they'll do like fun transition videos. So doing unique trends and um, I love doing that and finding ways that I can make that like relate to pole. So I yeah. think just like getting you, this how content is these days with so many people being able to content create. And it's like the barrier of entry is like very low now. I think Mm. it makes, um, it challenged you as a creator to be more creative and to explore different things and to be able to try different things. Um, I think that's why I really appreciate your content is because, you know, you do try things and, um, you, you know, experimenting with different content formats. It's not it always, doesn't always land. <laughs> yeah. And, and I do thing. that too. Right. Yeah. You, and but I, you, how I, else are you going to know unless you try? Yeah. And, um, I, a phrase I love is like to be cringe is to be free. So I think it's like not being afraid to be cringy or like to be embarrassing. I don't think it's embarrassing, but you know, just to put yourself out there. Um, if that's something you want to do and, um, I don't think that that's cringy at all. Yeah. And one thing as well that you've got to be reminded of, of for everyone listening to this is that actually, yeah, sure, you might be cringy. Well, guess what? Maybe 20% of your following would have seen it anyway, <laughs> if you're lucky. Like when you actually <laughs> consider how many of your following actually see your content, when you look at yeah. stats, mm-hmm. don't worry, boo. Probably not enough people saw it for them to really care that it was cringy. And you know what actually said was so funny is that sometimes some of the cringy stuff actually ends up people are sending it to their friends and stuff. And sure, they might not be saying nice stuff about it, but who gives a fuck if they're sharing your stuff? Like if they're engaging with it in some sort of way, what's that saying? Uh, All press is good press, like bad press is good press, (laughs) right? So true, isn't it? You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna say something maybe was a bit cringe, people are sharing it because it's a bit cringy. Who cares? Like it's better they share it for it being cringy than not sharing it at all. Yeah, I think I've always like I've I've kind of contributed any online success I've had is like there was a point in life where I just like I truly did just did not care what people thought about me right. posting. I think that held me back so much. Like growing up of like you know back in the day wanting to be like a makeup YouTuber guru thing, but not wanting to do it. And um, at some point. Like I just got over that and I, that's really why I contribute any success I've had online is like, I, I'm not to be afraid to be seen trying anymore. Like I will try different things. I'll put myself out there. It's definitely not for everybody. And, um, you know, I want people to do what they feel comfortable doing, especially if you're building an online pool business. I think Mm -hmm. authenticity is like very obvious and what feels authentic to a person. So yeah, I, I would encourage people to, 
you know, take a page out of your book and just try different things and yeah, you know, uh, there's, see what lands. there's so many people doing it now. And, you know, mm-hmm. I think when we talk about uh, content creation is, uh, I feel, so I consider content creation and just posting a poll video, two completely different things. Like, yeah. you know, content creation might be like a video where you're talking over it. It might be like a mm-hmm. get ready with me to go pole dancing. It might be like, mm-hmm. a, you know, here's a mini tutorial maybe or so like that is kind of content creation. And I guess mm-hmm. content creation, I guess the differentiation for me would be the adding value to the post like what what are people going to be able to get from the post if it's just a combo people can't really get much from that but if it's something where they could actually be engaged with you maybe there's a a post about a certain subject they'd love to chime in on that's Mm -hmm. great like you know it doesn't have to be you know anything crazy either like you know it could just be something as, as simple as hey guys like here's a video of me doing this um Mm -hmm. you know i found like today i was like Oh, I did this, this, and this. Has anyone ever tried this before? Give this a go, yeah. give it a say, whatever. And people might be like, oh, I've never tried that before. And you know, it's just how can you incite conversation, meaningful talks with your followers and provide them with value more than just saving your video? Because that's the thing, I love right? That. It's, I, I love think that. I feel like we're past that now. Yeah, and I think it's I think we're getting to a point where it's like we need to have a little bit more personality in our posts as well. I think to build a a business, like whether it's poll or anything else, it's like showing that personality and showing your interests outside of whatever niche you have. Um, I think people want to know who they're buying from. People want to know who they're following and who they're learning from. So um, something I like to do is like outside of poll, I always like to share like baking recipes um, I don't drink, so I all share like non-alcoholic mocktail recipes. So those nice. are things that are completely unpoll related, but kind of like to sprinkle in. Um, as a private person, sometimes it feels difficult. It's like it, it can be hard because I feel like we already give so much, but um, it's definitely something I'm kind of making a point to do because, um, yeah, I don't think people. Um, I think with poll, we a, a lot of accounts I look at, it's like. I don't really know you as a person. I know you as a dancer, mm. but I have no idea who you are. That's actually a really important point. Um, and I want to ask you a question about that. Do, you mentioned about, you know, you don't really like sharing your personal life. And actually, mm-hmm. I feel like I share a fair amount of like, I, I bet I probably say I'm similar to you. Like I'll share some stuff, my stories and yeah. stuff. And I don't ever really post about my husband very much. And this is like a big yeah. occasion. I kind of keep that private. But, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people say to me like, oh, you know, I don't want to be, giving my innermost like my fucking like life story to people that I don't know you know mm-hmm. like do you feel it's possible to do well on socials without actually going to that extreme level oh yeah I think that there's like a healthy balance um you can find I think for me I don't like um, I mentioned earlier but I was talking a bit about my creative rut so uh, that is something that I um would be open to sharing. And I have shared about with my audience and I was really surprised by how many people and especially pole dancers and pole instructors who feel the same way. Um, so I think just those little kind of tidbits in your life, you'd be, you'd be probably surprised of how many people feel the same way that you do. Um, so I think it's just finding a way that's like, um, uh, just a healthy balance of that. Like I don't, I don't expect anyone taking this conversation to be like, yeah, I'm going to just share everything about my personal life, my relationships, all that. Just, yeah, I think it's like a little bit of a a healthy mix of whatever you feel comfortable with and um, just letting people in a little bit. Something that I've um, I've been trying to share and post more about is like some like controversial opinions I may have that I've always kept to myself, like when it comes to pole brands or pole related businesses I've always kind of like kept it to myself to be professional but kind of trying to work on like being able to talk about that more just because it's not my (laughs) full-time job anymore right Um, but the thing is that (laughs) well I mean I don't know I don't know how long you've seen my stuff for but as you may have heard or may or may know like you know I've Mm -hmm. I've been through my stages of my career where I used to do that and I definitely don't Mm. do that so much anymore (laughs) Um, but anyone who knew me five six seven years ago will know that I would if I I didn't like something I would be honest about it 
And, and I will be honest to people now, face to face in a serious conversation with someone, but to post it on social media, people can take things in so many different ways. Yeah. But yeah, and I just find that now, if I feel like there's much controversy to it, I'll generally avoid it because I'm just like, it's not worth the hassle I'm going to get for it. And actually on that subject, have you had any controversy as a result of any of these posts? No, I haven't. Um, I haven't. I've, I've had some kind of back and forth with other brands, but no, nothing really. But I think that that's can I ask, something to Can you give me an example of one of them? Because is it like, yes. oh, I don't like the shape of this top. Is it like something really like not no. that bad at all? Or is it like, oh, this, this company's trash because, <laughs> you know what I mean? I can, yeah, I guess I can give you some tea a little bit. But, Come on, so I spill won't it, say, spill it. Yeah. I won't say the name of the brand, but it is a very well-known brand, and they have a list of very well-known ambassadors, people that I look up to. Um, this was a few years ago. They had reached out to me to do like a collaboration on some content. They wanted a TikTok and a story, um, and they didn't want to pay me, which is pretty unfortunately common in the pole space. Um, also, just like the fitness space. We can talk about that in a second. But Absolutely. Um, I want to. They, it's something that we've talked they, about a lot. Yeah, they didn't want to pay me, but they kind of like dangled a carrot where they're like, you know, well, we want to see where this collab goes, how well it goes, and then we can talk about future videos. Um, at the time, I was posting a lot. Like, I post every day, so it wasn't really a big deal for me to make a TikTok video. Um, so it was like in exchange for product. I made the video. Um, the video itself, and I made the, the Instagram post, uh, the Instagram story. Um, the video itself did fairly well for a poll TikTok, at least for me. It, I think it got over 120K views and nice. over 8K likes, right? Um, and then I, I, again, I posted the story as well. I didn't hear back from them at all about any of this. Um, fast forward a couple months ago, they emailed me and they were like, yeah, we'd like to work with you again, but um, the code that we gave you didn't really do any well, didn't do well. So we don't really want to pay you. Um, but Dan, the code that they gave me was a 5% off discount code. So what's the fuck you doing? I, oh, that, you know, it's like, they, why bother? And I was like, okay. I was like, listen, I work in e-commerce. I have not seen anything below a 10% discount code. You get a 10% discount code for just being a customer a first time customer, like, or signing up for a newsletter. So I was like, are you surprised that the code didn't work? Um, and also I gave them like the metrics to the, um, the TikTok post, which I also shared before. And I was like, you know what, this post did better than all of your TikToks combined, you know, up until this point too. So, um, that was that, uh, we kind of went back and forth, but I was just like, I'm dropping it. I, you know, and, it's, it was a lesson for me. Um, and I kind of think about that. I've never actually talked about this story before, but I kind of think about like, it, it's a lesson for me of like knowing your worth. Um, mm. I think a lot of pole brands, it's sad, but I, and I totally get the very small, like one person type of business. They don't have the marketing funds, but um, I do think that it's unfortunate that a lot of pole brands don't value creators in this space. Um, but why, but why, so I'm going to go back to what you said, so why, why don't they have the funds? Do you think they don't have the funds? Because sometimes I think they do. And actually, the, the only one who I'm going to, I'm going to say a name, because I've already said it in the other episode, was Pole Junkie. And the only reason I say Pole Junkie is because Pole Junkie don't actually make those clothes themselves. Yeah. They obviously add a mark onto it. I assume mm. maybe they don't make as much money per item, maybe. So they're going mm. more for mass mm -hmm. selling. Um, so they've kind of got a bit of a different approach. I do know though that they give their ambassadors shitloads of clothes. Um, yeah. I don't know whether that makes it okay. I mean, yeah. so I was chatting to another, um, like she's an influencer in London and she does influencing within the pole space, but actually a lot outside of the pole space. She doesn't just post about pole. And mm -hmm. she was telling me that the price and stuff that she charges, and she's like, honestly, pole is nowhere near. She's like, no, mm -hmm. she's like, she doesn't even bother really working with pole brands. She's like, because they mm -hmm. never ever offer enough. And she's like, for the yeah. amount of work it takes to, you know, help these brands and stuff, they get so much more out of it than what 
the creators do. So what would you at personally, you know, obviously don't, don't mention the names, but what would you have rec- recommended that that company, whoever they were, should have paid you? What do you think it was worth for a pole dance company? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really great question. Um, you know, I don't know if I want to give specific numbers. You can ask me privately or um, yeah. you can also ask me, DM me about that brand if you're curious on what that brand was. <laughs> but um, if you want the tea, drop into the DMs, yeah. people. <laughs> but um, I, so here's the thing. Like, I think that there is there is room for collaboration if you can figure out a deal that works for both of you. Um, I think that it's, it's not like, you know, I, you know, there, there's, there can be a happy medium if you figure it out, if the brand is willing to talk. And I think that that's where, um, I didn't appreciate is like the unwillingness to even talk. Like, I mean, right. let me give me the opportunity to show you my metrics and explain to you why this is a value. So I think that that's a big thing for me. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just like the willingness to work. And, but so I, you know had, why that is though? I think that's mm-hmm. because they're so used to pole dancers just saying, Oh, well, I'll take some free clothes that yeah. now they're speaking to someone who works in marketing and they know that you know better. They're a bit like, Oh, <laughs> they were probably really yeah. taken back by your message. A bit like, Fuck, oh, what? She doesn't want to, you, this person mm-hmm. who, you know, has got lots of followers realizes their worth, shock horror. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and, you know, I didn't necessarily want you to tell me what you specifically should be paid. But I mean, do you think people should be like if so, if I said to you, um, oh, someone's messaged me, they've offered me a hundred dollars. Like, mm-hmm. do you think a hundred dollars for a post like that is enough or should we be talking 500 or more? I think it completely depends on that person's uh, audience metrics. engagements, the metrics, what their page is. Um, I think a, a funny thing is like the follower count has always been like a a very one of the main probably one of the most important metrics in the past but i think it's becoming less so important because like as we know your follower count does not mean that that many people are seeing your post at all we both know that so i think it's the engagement rate and um you can you can easily tell just by clicking on someone's post and just seeing not just maybe uh, maybe a couple posts and just seeing like what their comment section looks like. You can kind of see some like share metrics. So kind of get a, a feel, but someone it's very possible as we both know to have like a very high following and just like very little engagement, which is really common. Which is common as well. Cause I think people are buying their followers. I mean, we've got a few people that in yeah. the UK that I um, I'd almost put money on that they've bought their followers yeah. because when you look at their posts, I'm like, how is someone with 200 and whatever it is thousand followers how have they only got six comments on a, on a post mm-hmm. and like less than a hundred likes or a hundred and something likes? I'm like, that's, mm-hmm. that's crazy to me. I'm yeah. just like, that's what they're getting on in their posts on their busy posts is what I get on my quiet posts. And I'm like, and I've got mm-hmm. nowhere near, like you've got over double what I've got. And I'm like, mm-hmm. huh? So I'm like, so I don't know as well though, because some of these accounts, they go viral because of something. They have mm-hmm. a video go viral. They get a lot of followers from it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know whether those viral videos are actually getting people followers because mm-hmm. I see a lot of viral content. I don't follow any mm-hmm. of them, <laughs> you know, because unless I see viral content from that person regularly, then maybe I'll follow them, maybe. But oh God, I'm sharing videos with my husband all the time. Like, I'm like, oh, this is so funny. Look at this. It's got millions of comments, like millions of like likes and stuff. I don't follow any of them if I'm being honest. Like, yeah. so I think that maybe some pole dancers are having some things go viral and then they're buying their followers at that point and being like, well, when my video went viral, I'm like, hmm, maybe I it's genuine. Like a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of opinions on like the follower metric. Um, um, something that it's actually interesting because um, the idea I, I listened to a, a previous podcast you did about and you, you were talking about um, losing followers and yeah. um, the idea of losing followers. And something that I was thinking about is like, um, I'd like to and this is how I reframe it, but I want other folks to reframe it as well as this is like if you're losing followers, it's not necessarily a bad thing it means that you're shedding people that wouldn't have interacted with your account anyways. So right. they were just sitting there. So it's like, it's, it's kind of in a way a blessing in disguise. I know it, I think it can also feel like it can feel like something's wrong with your content, but 
I want people to reframe it as like you're shedding those inactive accounts that one have interacted with your account anyways. Um, something I've actually been actively doing, I learned this strategy or I've been hearing about this strategy a lot is um, going in and manually removing followers. Yes, so I've been going, doing that. Yeah, so removing bot accounts or just anything that looks really spammy. Um, I've been, I'm going to see if that works because I'm, it's like an experiment I'd like to do, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a manual process and I wouldn't suggest anyone sign up for any third party apps that does that provides no. that service, but yeah, going through your list and seeing what could be spam and getting those people out. I remember, so when you go to your page, if you click on, I think you click on followers and then mm -hmm. at the top, yeah, here you go. See, I see now I need to go through mine again now because it's now mm -hmm. saying I've got more on there, saying I've got 127. But mm -hmm. um, it says potential spam. Yeah. Now, actually, some of them I go through and I'm like, that's definitely not spam. I actually know who yeah. that person is. <laughs> um, and so be really careful because sometimes um, people come up as potential spam sometimes yeah. if they are like shadow banned, apparently. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, but yeah, and be careful not to just accidentally press the removal button because, right. but yeah, if you go to your actual page, people, and click you on tell. followers, tell it will say potential spam, and you can yeah. just have a little look through it. And if, if it does look like a bot, just get rid of it. And I know, you know, you want these extra followers and stuff, but honestly, having those on your account creates such mm -hmm. a red flag for Instagram. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's really funny because I actually remember, I think I saw a post about that on Instagram somewhere about the whole like, you need to like try and cleanse every now and then yep. too. It's just time consuming. It's just trying to find the time because you, you can't just press delete, delete, delete. You have to check really and open the profile and see if it's genuine or not. I mean, right. how important do you think it is for pole dancers to really have a, a big following? I mean, do you mind if I ask how many are you at now? A hundred and... I think over 170 on Instagram. Insta. Um, Okay, at 700 something on TikTok, which does Whoa. not. I think that, well, see, it's one TikTok, TikTok following is like, does not really mean much. Um, Someone else told me that today. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm pretty sure most of that happened like at the very beginning of when I started, but yeah, that does not mean much. Um, but um, yeah. I think yeah so I was just saying about like d like how important do you think it is to have that following like so for you you've got this decent mm -hmm. following like how important is that for you now mm -hmm. I mean did you find it was more important to you when you were a pole instructor and you were trying to do it full time I think it was definitely something that was a bit more important to me then because when talking to those brands those are numbers that they want to know right at the start um it's kind of like an entry point for people. Um, but again, when you dive in, like I, I do feel like engagement is far more important than followers are. And I think it's a um, part of engagement is like, you can have a really strong engagement with like a thousand and have like a better engagement than if you had a hundred thousand. Um, so it's really about having yeah, the audience that supports you and interacts with your content, I think that's way more important than, you know, how big a metric number is. I think as well, you got to, I always say this to people when they say they want more followers, I'm like, but what for? You need to ask yourself, what what is the number going to help with? Because mm -hmm. I always say to people as well, that I would rather have 10,000 followers, 10,000 people that might, that are really interested mm -hmm. in my content and maybe right. purchasing things from me than having a hundred thousand people who may or may not. Like mm -hmm. that's why buying followers to me has never been of any interest because they're going to buy anything yeah. from me. It's going to make my number mm -hmm. look great, but I don't really give a shit about that. Like I care more about the people that are actually going to provide value to my posts and actually are potentially interested in working with me. Mm -hmm. These are the people exactly. I care about. If I didn't do this as a job, I wouldn't really care so much about that. But why do you think people do care, even if they don't do this as a job? Is it a, do you think it's like a, a thing where they just want that? I, I don't know, like, is it a childhood yeah. trauma thing? What is it? I don't get it. Yeah, I I think that this, this part of social media needs to be studied and it probably will be studied on like the effects of having these numbers in front of us. Um, 
but yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think it's a, it's a bit of a validation point. I think for people to like, oh, I am legitimate as a creator or as a pole instructor or, you know, an influencer of like having these numbers to support me. Um, but yeah, I think I, I'm hoping that this becomes less and less important as we continue going on as like the barrier of entry to create keeps getting, getting lower. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it'll become less important to people. I think especially because we're starting to realize that like the algorithm determines whether a video does well, it's not the quality or it's not like the information or the content of your video. It's really, it's, it's a, it's a game and it's like a right. luck of the draw sometimes. So it's like kind of realizing that there's, there's ways to help your video potentially do well or things that you can like levers you can pull, but ultimately it's a game that none of us can win at all times. <laughs> so just enjoying um, the, the art of making content and like the process of it and then sharing right. it with people. Yeah. And if it does well, it does well. And if it doesn't just accept that that's how it is. And, <laughs> yeah. and the next one might do better. You know, yeah. you, you mentioned earlier on, d did you say post every day? I used to, um, um, that was probably during like a pandemic time or I, I used to work from home. So I just had the, t the time to do it and I had like my pull space. So fairly and easy now? to do that. Um, now I probably do once or twice a week. Um, I kind of try to make it a point at least once a week to go into the studio or like have some time to create but it's definitely not a major priority for me anymore. And did you find, so when you were posting every day and now you're posting like once or twice, mm -hmm. what's the differences you've seen in terms of engagement following? Have you noticed mm -hmm. much of a difference or do you get just as much now as you did then? I actually, I would say, yes, there is a difference. I think when I was way more focused on it, I was also, I spent more time online. So just looking at trends and just being like, being more in tune with what people are posting, what type of content, even just things like trending audio and things to use. So when that was more of my focus, um, and when I had the space to do so, I think my content was definitely performed way better. Um, so it's, yeah, I think the energy you put into something really shows and um, my energy has not not been there fully, but um, I think it's great that I, I, I find more joy in it now, actually, because I feel like Cause before, it's less pressure. yeah, it was less, it's, there's less pressure now. And I feel like before it felt like, oh, I got to, I got to post, I got to do this. But now it's just like whenever I feel like it, whenever it works for me. Yeah. I've, one thing I've noticed about your page is that you have a very um, beautiful aesthetic to the page. How important do you think that is for Instagram or any social media? Because I've, again, spoken about this to lots of different people and we get mm -hmm. different opinions sometimes. I mean, my page, I think it's it's messy, but it's consistently messy because I have a lot of different places that I post from. Whereas I've noticed you tend to have very clean backgrounds, lots of mm -hmm. whites, bright colors, very clean mm -hmm. looking. And um, I always, I used to always use people like Kieran Roy, Dario Chief, for example, like this. When you look at their pages, it's the mm -hmm. aesthetics. Um, how important do you think aesthetics are for for people's pages? Like, how important do you think that is? I think it is a part of it. I think it's kind of like, I think it's it it helps people visually when they do click on your page to kind of get an uh, understanding of what they can expect from yeah. your content. Um, but like I said, I think it's more of a thing or yeah, I think it's more of a thing on Instagram, on TikTok, um, which potentially is getting banned in the U S so this may not be relevant, but, um, mm. on, on TikTok, just crazy. Like it, there's no rhyme or reason. I think they're, I think people like the more natural engaged. So not so much like aesthetic matters on that platform, but on Instagram, I do think it helps to have like, um, I think it, it's not so much having like a clean aesthetic, but just having uh, like a spe very specific brand that people can identify yeah. with your videos and they know that that's you, um, I think can be helpful. Absolutely. And I think that's why I've been really lucky in the sense that because I've always posted from many different studios because I train at so many yeah. different places, 
is being consistent. Whereas if I, I feel like it's worse. Like if you were to now post from a mm. random studio, it would really, people would be like, oh, that's weird. Yeah. They might not even recognize it's you because they'd be like, oh, yeah. that's really weird. Where is that? Like, <laughs> And I just feel like as well, whenever I say to people, I'm like, it doesn't take much to just tidy the back of your video. Mm -hmm. Just move your bag and all your crap that's on the floor. Pick up your grips and just put them the other mm -hmm. side of the camera, you know? It's like, it does make a difference. Do you find it makes a difference to you when someone's got like a really messy room and stuff or, you know, that the, it's not been cleaned or whatever and you can just really tell in the video? Do you find it makes a difference to your viewing pleasure, I guess? Oh yeah, I, I think it makes a difference for me. Aesthetics are very important to me and I think that's my marketing brain um, and making things like visually appealing. But I mean, it's funny because like we can say this, but it's like a video can pop off and have m many and it's, it, it really depends. So it's, yeah, who knows? But for me, yes, I think it helps. Um, I think outfits help too, in a way. I always think about outfits. You wear a lot um, of pretty outfits actually. I've noticed oh, thank that. thank you so much. Like how, I, how much, and you always look like you're, don't say this the wrong way. Like you always look like you've really made like an effort on like the hair, the makeup. Do you spend much time like, making sure that everything's on point aesthetically, not just you know, the outfit, like makeup, hair, everything. I tend to just get ready every day anyway. So like the hair and makeup, that's like, this is like post work, for example. But, sure. okay. um, so I don't, it's, I don't feel like I go out of my way in those aspects, but for outfits, I do t think about it. Um, I love, I, yeah, I guess I just love the, the process of like thinking about what I'm going to wear for pole. And um, I think it's fun. I think that's a fun aspect of pole. It's definitely not something that everyone has to do. Like I, many people don't care. And I think that that's great. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but for me, I, it is a part of, I think my, my style and I think how people identify me. Um, something I think about a lot is like, I do like to wear fun outfits, but um, also thinking about like how covered up I am in a way um, uh -huh. because of those, like the content moderation, as we talked about, like I, um, it is, it's a part of my own personal style. I don't feel like I tend to wear like bikini tops or anything like that. So it's, it feels authentic to me, but I always am mindful of like having coverage or yeah, having it's so uh, sad, isn't it? That we have to do that, isn't that so yeah. sad? I mean, obviously, again, like I'm really lucky being a guy, it's so lucky for me. I mean, I can go topless and it's really no problem, but like, again, like I don't ever really wear shorts when my booty is really out because mm -hmm. it can get flagged up. Like, I tend to now when I'm doing all my heel stuff, I tend to wear like the baggy pants and stuff, and mm -hmm. I kind of like that aesthetic for me anyway, it just feels quite fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just yeah, I don't know. For me, I feel so bad for the, especially the stripper style crew, because obviously yeah. their aesthetic is sexy, mm -hmm. sexy, tiny outfits and stuff. And I just think, God, like sometimes I see the content and I just think there's, there's no way that's not going to get banned. You know, when you just think, yeah. well, you know, and I feel sorry for that person that they can't just, you know, follow their own style or what they want to do but this this is the thing this is the problem with being on a platform that we don't own or we don't pay mm -hmm. for you know we are on mm -hmm. so, it's, it's like walking into someone's house and they say listen i don't really want you to wear this outfit like because my parents are here kind of thing you kind of have to respect mm -hmm. it don't you because it's not your house and i feel like i try to think of it as similar i know it's very different but obviously i try to think mm -hmm. of it as similar but it's sad that we have to do that I'm, I'm really conscious of, yeah. oh, sorry, go on. Say what you're going to say. I'm just really conscious of no. time. Yeah. Um, I, what's, what I've noticed is also something that really just breaks my heart is like larger bodies getting policed more for what they wear, even if it's like the mm. same type of top, but just having a different body could get right. you in trouble more, which I think you talked about with, um, Dr. Carolina Hades, that yeah. podcast episode I watched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's very sad. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, Carolina is doing so much good work on, like, mm -hmm. the shadow banning and stuff. And she is obviously a massive supporter of sex workers. And so she gets, she deals with a lot of that. Like, she's constantly trying to help people with it. It's, it's really sad. And, you know, I'm so lucky in a way, it sounds terrible, that, that, that that's not my style. Because if it was, I'd be like, damn, like, how am I going to work my way around that? Like, right. what would your what would your advice actually be? Let's say, for example, a stripper style public came to you and said, listen, mm -hmm. I want to 
grow but i'm just struggling here what can i do like would it literally just be like either cover up or there's nothing we can do yeah, that's yeah that's um i think you mentioned like you mentioned like the cargo pants and i think like finding a style or mixture of maybe like a bikini top big bottom um so it's yeah. not like everything is showing which i may or may not help with the algorithm but i think that that could be like a compromise um i think another thing is potentially playing with lighting so some videos i like to do like silhouette lighting so really dark mm -hmm. lighting i know again this is just like these are things that's like why do we have to do these things but of some things that people can think about and and you, did you ever found that the silhouetting helps oh yeah yes because you can't really see specific body parts but you can see like the silhouette of your body which one getting you in trouble um interesting yeah. yeah what are your um i want to so at the end of every podcast i've kind of been asking everyone like what are your main like top tips do you have any like top tips for social media like if someone was coming to you and said i want to grow what mm -hmm. can i do differently what 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 would you recommend to them what would you say are the main staple things they need to be doing um so one thing that we talked about was incorporating a little bit more of your personality into your posts um i think that as pole dancers we kind of like we kind of fall into like educational posts or sometimes showing off a choreo or a combo um and it's it's very like cut and dry it's like this is my this is my combo but i think finding little ways incorporating ways whether that's maybe like through story posts even of just like showing your personality, your interests outside of pole. I think people want to know who you are and who they're learning from. So I think that that's really helpful. Um, I think, um, yeah, looking for inspiration outside of pole, the pole space and seeing what people are doing. I always love watching like yoga videos. Those people do really well. And they, um, I mean, given, I guess like their, their content is a little bit tame, but um, right. they do really well. And I, I love watching makeup videos to, you know, learn about different transitions that people do. So I think yeah. finding inspiration and finding those trends outside of pole can really help. Um, more tactical things that people can do. I mentioned like trending audio has always been really helpful. Um, but not even just like trending audio, but it's like audio that is going to be trending. So, um, those big songs that everyone dances to may not be as helpful as like a very like a very like like a unpopular i don't know if that's the word but like a song that's just getting to be popular that's um um has less usage and how and how do people so there was a i don't know if you're going to say the same but there was someone had told me once that on when you're looking at music mm -hmm. there's like the little arrow that points up yeah. next to next to the music and if it's got yep. less than kind of 500 plays and uses those yep. tend to be the best ones because they're kind of on the upward but they're not yep. gone big yet is that how you term that's tend exactly to gauge it? it right yep. cool i was yep. gonna say so you don't use any apps or anything to find you like trending audio or anything like that I don't. It's just really uh, like just being active and like f using the app a lot and like no, just being active on the app and seeing what other people are posting, I think helps. Um, using the features that are built in the app can be really yeah. helpful as well. So Ooh, uh, that's a question. Do yeah. you edit your video in app or out of app? Because there is this whole debate about if you edit your content out of the app, it's less favored on the app. What's your thoughts on that? I do both. So if I can, I stay in the app and I'll use their in-app fonts, their in-app music, et cetera, um, and I'll clip things together if I can use their transitions. Um, but yeah, for ease, sometimes I've used like CapCut, but I yeah. try to keep it simple if I can. I wouldn't use another app edit or like take content from another app and then use it for something else. Like I went take TikTok content and put it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, no, and I think that the more you can use, so Instagram will come out with new features. Like they recently came out with the poll feature on in your captions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So whenever they come out with anything new, I always would suggest like taking advantage of that because they use will prefer it. 
to promote those type of content or like the question response feature, things like mm -hmm. that. It always helps. Um, um, so yeah, that, that's a big someone, thing. Like, someone else did suggest that as well. They were like, listen, if, if Instagram is going to do a new feature, make sure the first one on it, because they will yeah. favor you for doing that because they want mm -hmm. these new features to be used. So as soon as someone's using it, they're going to push that person's content. It's very, very clever. And I totally agree. How important do you think captions are out of interest? Captions, thoughts on those, I think hashtags? Yeah, I think they're incredibly important. So um, I don't know if you saw recently, but they introduced like the AI chat, which no one asked for, no one wanted, but they introduced it. Did you, did you get that? It's like the on AI Instagram? search. Yeah. I don't think I've got that update yet. I'm gonna have to send that to you. So it's like this search feature that, um, it's like an AI chatbot, basically, that Instagram um, included now. Um, huh. So they're moving away. I, In my opinion, this is all just things I've gathered and in my experience. Like, I feel like hashtags are just not important as they used to be. Before, you used to be able to click on hashtags and see recent posts in that hashtag. And that's <sighs> how people, yeah, yes. that's how people I used to figure out. Anymore. That's how people used to figure out if they're shadow banned or not. Because they right. would use like a weird hashtag, and if they didn't show up for it, then they were shadow banned. Um, so hashtags are not as important. I will still use them. Meta suggests using three to eight, so perhaps not like that huge, big chunk of hashtags that we all used to do, uh, but just <laughs> a few, few that are specific. So I, um, I'm kind of trying to avoid like hashtag pole dancing, for example. Right, and, I'm the same. I don't even really use yeah. them anymore. I just got bored yeah. of using them. I was like, it's not doing anything. I just can't know it's yeah. ever doing anything. So I never bother. And so in, instead, I really think that the caption is where the the algorithm or whatever is crawling for the information and that's where it's pulling from. So descriptive captions or explaining what's in the video, I think is really helpful. And with the hashtags, sorry, last question, with the, with the hashtags, do you put them in the caption or in the comments? I've seen people doing that where instead of putting it in their caption, yeah. they'll put their caption and then they comment on their own video yeah. with the hashtags. What's your, what, why do people I'm do that? almost certain you need to put it in the caption. I think that in the past, like, I, I think that they'll still technically pull up, but I would say put it in the caption so it's like for sure going to be crawled if, if the algorithm does that. <laughs> Well, and this is the most annoying thing is that we just don't know what the algorithm does. I know. wish it was more transparent, you know, because then people would have more chance of actual success on this app. But in a way, I think that's probably what they don't want is because they don't want people to know exactly what you've got to do. Because obviously everyone would be doing it, I guess. But yeah, oh, I feel like it's such a minefield social media. There's so many different things. But honestly, you've been so helpful. I love talking to you. Like you've had given so many useful tips. For anyone who's listening to this now who still is crazy and isn't following you, what's your Instagram name and TikTok name so they can go and follow you? Yep, um, it's Angela Ariel, one word, um, on every platform. And give us the uh, studio name again and whereabouts it is if people want to come visit you. It's Raven Studios and it's in Seattle, Washington. So I would love to meet y'all in person and... I hope I get to meet you in person, Dan. Yeah, well, I, so I really want to do a US tour next year. It's like on my main to-do list is to try and see if I can find a way to get a working visa to come over. Um, but I'm one of these super paranoid people that will only come over <laughs> if I have a working visa. I'm just too scared of going mm -hmm. on a visitor's visa and just hoping for the best. So I really don't want to do that. So I'm just, it's on my to-do list this year to try and see if I can get something sorted in the mid next year. Yeah, of okay, course. I, I'd love to come to Seattle as well because I've heard it's really cool there. But um, thank you so much. And like like I said, anyone that's listening to this now, make sure you go and follow Angela. And also, if you are in Seattle area, make sure you go and visit. <laughs> the way that now that you're saying Seattle, <laughs> the way I say Seattle is just so annoying. <laughs> you're like, come to Seattle. And I'm like, Seattle, go to Seattle. <laughs> oh, sounds so horrible. I hate it but yeah it. thank you so much i really appreciate you coming on and yes i hope we'll get to meet and dance together soon take care of yourself thank you so much bye bye thanks so much for listening to this episode isn't angela like the sweetest person ever she was so nice i had such a lovely chat with her i really hope you enjoyed this episode make sure you go and follow her because she is absolutely amazing and until next time
Bye. That was all the tea that you can get this week. Join me next time right here. It's the weekly tea.